Chapter Two of Kipps. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Kipps by H. G. Wells. Chapter Two. One. When Kipps left New Romney with a small yellow tin box, a still smaller portmanteau, a new umbrella, and a keepsake half sixpence to become a draper, he was a youngster of fourteen thin with whimsical drake's tails at the pole of his head small features and eyes that were sometimes very light and sometimes very dark gift those of his birth and by the nature of his training he was indistinct in his speech confused in his mind and retreating in his manners inexorable fate had appointed him to serve his country in commerce and the same national bias towards private enterprise and leaving bad alone, which had left his general education to Mr. Woodrow, now indentured him firmly into the hands of Mr. Shulford of the Folkestone Drapery Bazaar. Apprenticeship is still the recognised English way to the distributing branch of the social service. If Mr. Kipps had been so unfortunate as to have been a German, he might have been educated in an elaborate and costly special school, over-educated, crammed up, calling old Kipps, to fit him for his end, such being their pedagogic way. He might, but why make unpatriotic reflections in a novel? There was nothing pedagogic about Mr. Shalford. He was an irascible, energetic little man, with hairy hands, for the most part under his coat-tails, a long, shiny, bald head, a pointed aquiline nose a little askew, and a neatly trimmed beard. He walked lightly and with a confident jerk, and he was given to humming. He had added to exceptional business, push, bankruptcy under the old dispensation, and judicious matrimony. His establishment was one of the most considerable in Folkestone, and he insisted on every inch of frontage by alternate stripes of green and yellow down the house over the shops. His shops were numbered three, five and seven on the street, and on his bill's heads three to seven. He encountered the abashed and awe-stricken Kipps with the praises of his system and himself. He spread himself out behind his desk with a grip on the lapel of his coat and made Kipps a sort of speech. "'We expect you to work, you know, and we expect you to study our interests,' explained Mr. Shulford in the regal and commercial plural. "'Our system here is the best system you could have. I made it and I ought to know.' I began at the very bottom of the ladder when I was fourteen, and there isn't a step in it I don't know. Not a step. Mr. Booch in the desk will give you cards of rules and fines. Just wait a minute. He pretended to be busy with some dusty memoranda under a paperweight, while Kipps stood in a sort of paralysis of awe regarding his new master's oval baldness. Two thousand three forty-seven pounds, whispered Mr. Shawford audibly, feigning forgetfulness of Kipps clearly a place of great transactions mr shawford rose and handing kipps a blotting pad and an ink pot to carry mere symbols of servitude for he made no use of them emerged into a counting house where three clerks had been feverishly busy ever since his door handle had turned booch said mr shawford have you copied the rules and a downtrodden, shabby little old man, with a ruler in one hand and a quill pen in his mouth, silently held out a small book with green and yellow covers, mainly devoted, as Kipps presently discovered, to a voracious system of fines. He became acutely aware that his hands were full, and that everybody was staring at him. He hesitated a moment before putting the inkpot down to free a hand. "'Was a fumble like that?' said Mr. Shawford, as Kipps pocketed the rules. "'Won't do here. Come along, come along,' cocked his coat-tails high as a lady might hold up her dress, and led the way into the shop. A vast, interminable place, it seemed to Kipps, with unending, shining counters and innumerable, faultlessly dressed young men, and presently, hoary-like young women staring at him. Here there was a long vista of gloves dangling from overhead rods, there ribbons and baby linen. A short young lady in black mittens was making out the account of a gummer and was clearly confused in her addition by Shawford's eagle eye. A thick-set young man with a bald head and a round, very wise face, who was profoundly absorbed in adjusting all the empty chairs down the counter to absolutely equal distances, awoke out of his preoccupation 
and answered respectfully to a few Napoleonic and quite unnecessary remarks from his employer. Kipps was told that this young man's name was Mr Buggins, and that he was to do whatever Mr Buggins told him to do. They came round a corner into a new smell, which was destined to be the smell of Kipps' life for many years, the vague distinctive smell of Manchester goods. A fat man with a large nose jumped, actually jumped at their appearance, and began to fold a pattern of damask in front of him, exactly like an automaton that is suddenly set going. "'Cot shot, see to this boy tomorrow," said the master. "'See he don't fumble. Smarten him up.' "'Yes, sir,' said Carshot, fatly, glanced at Kipps, and resumed his pattern folding with extreme zeal. "'Whatever Mr. Carshot says you do, you do.' said Mr. Shalford, trotting onward, and Carshot blew out his face with an appearance of relief. They crossed a large room full of the strangest things Kipps had ever seen, ladylike figures surmounted by black wooden knobs, in the place of the refined heads one might have reasonably expected, stood about with a lifelike air of conscious fashion. "'Costume room,' said Shalford. Two voices engaged in some sort of argument. "'I can assure you, Miss Mergle, you are entirely mistaken, entirely in supposing I should do anything so unwomanly,' sank abruptly, and they discovered two young ladies, taller and fairer than any of the other young ladies, and with black trains to their dresses, who were engaged in writing at a little table. Whatever they told him to do, Kipps gathered, he was to do. He was also, he understood, to do whatever Carshot and Booch told him to do, and there were also Buggins and Mr. Shulford, and not to forget or fumble. They descended into a cellar called the Warehouse, and Kipps had an optical illusion of errand boys fighting. Some aerial voice said, Teddy! and the illusion passed. He looked again and saw quite clearly that they were packing parcels and always would be, and that the last thing in the world that they would or could possibly do was to fight. Yet he gathered from the remarks Mr. Shulford addressed to their busy backs that they had been fighting, no doubt at some past period of their lives. Emerging in the shop again, among a litter of toys and what are called fancy articles, Shulford withdrew a hand from beneath his coat-tails to indicate an overhead change carrier. He entered into elaborate calculations to show how many minutes in one year were saved thereby, and lost himself among the figures, Seven turns eight, seven, nine, was it? Or seven, eight, nine? Now, now. Why, when I was a boy your age, I could do a sum like that as soon as hear it. We'll soon get you into better shape than that. Make you efficient. Well, you must take my word it comes to pounds and pounds saved in the year. Pounds and pounds. System. System everywhere. Efficiency. He went on murmuring efficiency and system at intervals for some time. They passed into a yard, and Mr. Shalford waved his hand to his three delivery vans, all striped green and yellow. Uniform, green, yellow, system. All over the premises were pinned absurd little cards. This door locked after 7.30, by order, Edwin Shalford, and the like. Mr. Shalford always wrote by order, though it conveyed no earthly meaning to him. He was one of those people who collect technicalities upon them, as the reduvious bug collects dirt. He was the sort of man who is not only ignorant, but absolutely incapable of English. When he wanted to say he had a six-halfpenny long cloth to sell, he put it thus to startled customers, "'Can do you one six-half if you like!' He always omitted pronouns and articles and so forth. It seemed to him the very essence of the efficiently businesslike. His only preposition was as, or the compound as per. He abbreviated every word he could. He would have considered himself the laughing stock of Wood Street if he had chanced to spell socks in any way but socks, S-O-X. But on the other hand, if he saved words here, he wasted them there. He never acknowledged an order that was not an esteemed favour, nor sent a pattern without begging to submit it. He never stipulated for so many months' credit, but bought in November as Jan. It was not only words he abbreviated in his London communications. In paying his wholesalers, his system admitted of a constant error in the discount of a penny or tuppence, and it facilitated business, he alleged, to ignore odd pence in the cheques he wrote. His ledger clerk was so struck with the beauty of this part of the system 
that he started a private one on his own account with the stamp box that never came to Shulford's knowledge. This admirable British merchant, with glow with a particular pride of intellect when writing his London orders, "'Ah, do you think you'll ever be able to write London orders?' he would say with honest pride to Kipps, waiting impatiently long after closing time to take these triumphs of commercial efficiency to post, and so end the interminable day. Kipps shook his head, anxious for Mr. Shulford to get on. "'Now here, for example, I've written, see, I piece one in one, cock, bolt, alas, one or, what do, we, what do I mean by that or, eh, you know?' Kipps promptly hadn't the faintest idea. "'And then, two and silk net as perhaps herewith. E, uh, eh? Dunno, sir. It was not Mr. Shulford's way to explain things. Dear, dear, pity you couldn't get some commercial education at your school, instead of all this literary stuff. Well, my boy, if you're not a bit sharper, you'll never write London orders. That's pretty plain. Just stick stamps on all those letters and mind you stick them right way up and try to profit a little more by the opportunities your aunt and uncle have provided you. Can't say what'll happen to you if you don't. And Kipps, tired, hungry and belated, set about stamping with vigour and dispatch. Lit the envelope, said Mr Shulford. Lit the envelope, as though he grudged the youngster the postage stamp gum. It's the little things mount up, he would say. And indeed, that was his philosophy of life, to hustle and save always to hustle and save. His political creed linked reform, which meant nothing, with peace and economy, which meant a sweated expenditure, and his conception of a satisfactory municipal life was to keep down the rates. Even his religion was to save his soul and to preach a similar cheese-pairing to the world. 2. The indentures that bound Kipps to Mr Shulford were antique and complex, they insisted on the latter gentleman's parental privileges, they forbade Kipps to dice and game, they made him over, boy and soul, to Mr Shulford for seven long years, the crucial years of his life. In return there were vague stipulations about teaching the whole art and mystery of the trade to him, but as there were no penalty attached to negligence, Mr Shulford, being a sound practical businessman, considered this a mere rhetorical flourish, and set himself assiduously to get as much out of Kipps, and to put as little into him as he could in the seven years of their intercourse. What he put into Kipps was chiefly bread and margarine, infusions of chicory and tea dust, colonial meat by contract at threepence a pound, potatoes by the sack, and watered beer. If, however, Kipps chose to buy any supplementary material for growth, Mr. Shulford had the generosity to place his kitchen resources at his disposal free, if the fire chanced to be going. He was also allowed to share a bedroom with eight other young men, and to sleep in a bed which, except in very severe weather, could be made, with the help of his overcoat and private underlinen, not to mention newspapers, quite sufficiently warm for any reasonable soul. In addition, Kipps was taught the list of fines, and how to tie up parcels, to know where goods were kept in Mr. Shulford's systemised shop, to hold his hands extended upon the counter, and to repeat such phrases as, "'What can I have the pleasure? No trouble, I assure you,' and the like, to block, fold, and measure materials of all sorts, to lift his hat from his head when he passed Mr. Shulford abroad, and to practise a servile obedience to a large number of people. But he was not, of course, taught the cost-mark of the goods he sold, nor anything of the method of buying such goods, nor was his attention directed to the unfamiliar social habits and fashions to which his trade ministered. The use of half the goods he saw sold and was presently to assist in selling he did not understand, materials for hanging, cretons, chintzes and the like, serviettes and all the bright hard whiteware of a well-ordered house, pleasant dress materials, linings, stiffenings, they were to him from first to last no more than things heavy and difficult to handle in bulk that one folded up, unfolded, cut into lengths and saw dwindle and pass away out into the mysterious happy world in which the customer dwells. Kipps hurried from piling linen tablecloths that were collectively as heavy as lead to eat off oilcloth in a gas-lit dining room underground 
and he dreamt of combing endless blankets beneath his overcoat, spare undershirt, and three newspapers, so he had at least the chance of learning the beginnings of philosophy. In return for these benefits he worked so that he commonly went to bed exhausted and footsore. His round began at half-past six in the morning, when he would descend, unwashed and shirtless, in old clothes and a scarf and ducks' boxes, and yawn and take down wrappers and clean the windows until eight. Then in half an hour he would complete his toilet and take an austere breakfast of bread and margarine, and what only an imperial Englishman would admit to be coffee, after which refreshment he ascended to the shop for the labours of the day. Commonly these began with a mighty running to and fro with planks and boxes and goods for Carshot, the window-dresser, who, whether he worked well or ill, nagged persistently by reason of a chronic indigestion until the window was done. Sometimes the costume window had to be dressed, and then Kip staggered down the whole length of the shop from the costume room with one after another of those ladylike shapes grasped firmly but shamefully each about her single ankle of wood. Such days as there was no window dressing, there was a mighty carrying and lifting of blocks and bales of goods into piles and stacks. After this there were terrible exercises, at first almost despairfully difficult. Certain sorts of goods that came in folded had to be rolled upon rollers, and for the most part refused absolutely to be rolled, at any rate by kips. Certain other sorts of goods that came from the wholesalers rolled had to be measured and folded, and folding makes young apprentices wish they were dead. All of it, too, quite avoidable trouble, you know, that is not avoided because of the cheapness of the genteeler sorts of labour and the dearness of forethought in the world. And then consignments of new goods had to be marked off and packed into paper parcels, and Carshort packed like conjuring tricks, and Kipps packed like a boy with taste in some other direction, not ascertained, and always Carshot nagged. He had a curious form of appeal to his visceral economy that the refinement of our times and the earnest entreaties of my friends obliged me to be render by an etiolated paraphrase. My art and liver I never see such a boy, so I will present Carshot's refrain. And even when he was within a foot or so of the customer's face, the disciplined ear of Kipps would still at times develop a featureless intercalary murmur into, well, my art and liver. There came a blessed interval when Kipps was sent abroad matching. This consisted chiefly in supplying unexpected defects in buttons, ribbon, lining and so forth in the dressmaking department. He was given a written paper of orders with patterns pinned thereto and discharged into the sunshine and interest of the street. Then until he thought it wise to return and stand the racket of his delay, he was a free man, clear of all reproach. He made remarkable discoveries in topography, as, for example, that the most convenient way from the establishment of Mr. Adolphus Davis to the establishment of Messrs. Plummer, Roddice and Tyrrell, two of his principal places of call, is not, as is generally supposed, down the Sandgate Road, but up the Sandgate Road, round by West Terrace and along the Lees to the lift. Watch the lift up and down twice, but not longer, because that wouldn't do. Back along the Lees watch the harbour for a short time, and then round by the churchyard, and so, hurrying, into Church Street and Rendezvous Street. But on some exceptionally fine days the route lay through Radnor Park to the pond, where little boys sail ships, and there are interesting swans. He would return to find the shop settling down to the business of serving customers, and now he had to stand by to furnish any help that was necessary to the seniors who served, to carry parcels and bills about the shop, to clear away stuff after each engagement, to hold up curtains until his arms ached, and what was more difficult than all, to do nothing, and not stare disconcertingly at customers when there was nothing for him to do. He plumbed an abyss of boredom, or stood a mere carcass with his mind far away, fighting the enemies of the empire, or steering a dreamship perilously into unknown seas, to be recalled sharply to our higher civilization by some bustling seniors, Nay, nah, and Kipps, not alive, Kitch old, my heart and liver. At half past seven o'clock, except on late nights, a feverish activity of straightening up began, and when the last shutter was up outside, Kipps, with the speed of an arrow leaving a bow, would start hanging wrappers over the fixtures and over the piles of wares upon the counters, 
preparatory to a vigorous scattering of wet sawdust and the sweeping out of the shop. Sometimes people would stay long after the shop was closed. They don't mind a bit at Shawford's, these ladies used to say, and while they loitered it was forbidden to touch a wrapper or take any measure to conclude the day until the doors closed behind them. Mr. Kipps would watch these later customers from the shadow of a stack of goods, and death and disfigurement was the least he wished for them. Rarely much later than nine, a supper of bread and cheese and watered beer awaited him downstairs, and that consumed, the rest of the day was entirely at his disposal for reading, recreation, and the improvement of his mind. The front door was locked at half-past ten, and gas in the dormitory extinguished at eleven. 3. On Sundays he was obliged to go to church once, and commonly he went twice, for there was nothing else to do. He sat in the free seats at the back, he was too shy to sing, and not always clever enough to keep his place in the prayer book, and he rarely listened to the sermon. But he had developed a sort of idea that going to church had a tendency to alleviate life. His aunt wanted to have him confirmed, but he evaded this ceremony for some years. In the intervals between services he walked about Folkestone with an air of looking for something. Folkestone was not so interesting on Sundays as on weekdays because the shops were shut, but on the other hand there was a sort of confusing brilliance along the front of the Lees in the afternoon. Sometimes the apprentice next above him would condescend to go with him, but when the apprentice next but one above him condescended to go with the apprentice next above him, then Kipps, being habited as yet in ready-made clothes without tails, and unsuitable therefore to appear in such company, went alone. Sometimes he would strike out into the country, still as if looking for something he missed, but the rope of meal-times hailed him home again, and sometimes he would invest the major portion of the weekly allowance of a shilling that old Booch handed out to him in a sacred concert on the pier. He would sometimes walk up and down the Lees between twenty and thirty times after supper, desiring much the courage to speak to some other person in the multitude similarly employed. Almost invariably he ended his Sunday footsore. He never read a book, there were none for him to read, and besides, in spite of Mr Woodrow's guidance through a cheap and cheaply annotated edition of The Tempest, English literature, he had no taste that way. He never read any newspapers except occasionally titbits or a halfpenny comic. His chief intellectual stimulus was an occasional argy bargy that sprang up between Carshot and Buggins at dinner. Kipps listened as if to unparalleled wisdom and wit, and treasured all the gems of repartee in his heart against the time when he too should be a Buggins and have the chance and courage for speech. At times there came breaks in this routine, sale times darkened by extra toil and work past midnight, but brightened by a sprat supper and some shillings in the way of premiums. And every year, not now and then, but every year, Mr Shulford, with parenthetic admiration of his own generosity and glancing comparisons with the austerer days when he was apprenticed, conceded Kipps no less than ten days holiday, ten whole days every year. Many a poor soul at Portland might well envy the fortunate Kipps, insatiable heart of man, but how those days were grudged and counted as they snatched themselves away from him one after another. Once a year came stock-taking, and at intervals gusts of marking off goods newly arrived. Then the splendour of Mr. Shulford's being shone with oppressive brilliancy. System, he would say, system, car muscle and issue sharp, confusing, contradictory orders very quickly. Carshot trotted about, confused, perspiring, his big nose up in the air, his little eye on Mr. Shulford, his forehead crinkled, his lips always going to the formula, Oh, my heart and liver! The smart junior and the second apprentice vied with one another in obsequious alacrity. The smart junior aspired to Carshot's position, and that made him almost violently subservient to Shulford. They all snapped at Kipps. Kipps held the blotting pad and the safety ink pot and a box of tickets, and ran and fetched things. If he put the ink down before he went to fetch things, Mr Shulford usually knocked it over, and if he took it away, Mr Shulford wanted it before he returned. 
"'You make my tooth ache, Kipps,' Mr. Shalford would say. "'You give me neuralgia. "'You got no more system in you than a bad potato.' And at the time when Kipps carried off the ink pot, Mr. Shalford would become purple in the face and jab around with his dry pen at imaginary ink pots and swear, and Carshot would stand and vociferate, and the smart junior would run to the corner of the department and vociferate, and the second apprentice would pursue Kipps, vociferating, Look alive, Kipps! Look alive! Ink, man! Ink! A vague self-disgust that shaped itself as an intense hate of Shalford and all his fellow creatures filled the soul of Kipps during these periods of storm and stress. He felt that the whole business was unjust and idiotic, but the why and the wherefore was too much for his unfortunate brain. His mind was a welter. One desire, the desire to dodge some, at least of a pelting storm of disagreeable comment, guided him through a fumbling performance of his duties. His disgust was infinite. It was not decreased by the inflamed ankles and sore feet that form a normal incident in the business of making an English draper, and the senior apprentice Minton, a gaunt, sullen-faced youngster, with close-cropped, wiry black hair, a loose, ugly mouth, and a moustache like a smudge of ink, directed his attention to deeper aspects of the question, and sealed his misery. "'When you get too old to work, they chuck you away,' said Minton. "'Law, you find old drapers everywhere, tramps, beggars, dock labourers, bus conductors, quab, anywhere but in a crib.' "'Don't they got shops of their own? "'Lord, how are they to get shops of their own? "'They haven't any capital. "'How's the draper's shopman to save up five hundred pounds even? "'I tell you it can't be done. "'You've got to stick to cribs until it's over. "'I tell you we're in a blessed drain pipe, "'and we've got to crawl along it till we die.' "'The idea that fermented perpetually in the mind of Minton "'was to hit the little beggar slap in the eye, "'the little beggar being Mr. Shalford, and see how his blessed system met that. This threat filled Kipps with splendid anticipations whenever Shalford went marking off on Minton's department. He would look at Minton and look at Shalford and decide where he would best like Shalford hit. But for reasons known to himself, Shalford never pished and tussed with Minton as he did at the harmless car shot, and this interesting experiment upon the system was never attempted. 4. There were times when Kipps would lie awake, all others in the dormitory asleep and snoring, and think dismally of the outlook Minton pictured. Dimly he perceived the thing that had happened to him, how the great stupid machine of retail trade had caught his life into its wheels, a vast irresistible force which he had neither strength of will nor knowledge to escape. This was to be his life until his days should end. No adventures, no glory... No change, no freedom, neither, though the force of that had come home to him later, might he dream of effectual love and marriage. And there was a terrible something called the swap, or the key of the street, and crib hunting, of which the talk was scanty but sufficient. Night after night he would resolve to enlist, to run away to sea, to set fire to the warehouse, or drown himself, and morning after morning he rose up and hurried downstairs in fear of a sixpenny fine. He would compare his dismal round of servile drudgery with those windy sunlit days at Littleston, those windows of happiness shining ever brightly as they receded. The little figure of Anne seemed in all those windows now. She too had happened on evil things. When Kipps went home for the first Christmas after he was bound, that great suspended resolve of his to kiss her flared up to hot determination, and he hurried out and whistled in the yard. There was a silence, and then old Kipps appeared behind him. "'It's no good you're whistling there, my boy,' said old Kipps in a loud, clear tone, designed to be audible over the wall. "'They've cleared out all you had any trot with. She's gone as help to Ashford, my boy. Help? Slave is what we used to call them, but times are changed. Wonder they didn't say Lady Help while they were about it. It'll be like em. And Sid? Sid had gone too. Aaron boy or something, said old Kipps, to one of those air blasted cycle shops. As he? said Kipps, with a feeling that he had been scripped about the chest, and he turned quickly and went indoors. Old Kipps, still supposing him present, went on to further observations of an anti pornic tendency. When Kipps got upstairs, safe in his own bedroom, 
He sat down on the bed and stared at nothing. They were caught. They were all caught. All life took on the hue of one perpetual dismal Monday morning. The Hurons were scattered. The wrecks and the beach had passed away from him. The sun of those warm evenings at Littleston had set for evermore. The only pleasure left for the brief remainder of his holiday after that was to think he was not in the shop. Even that was transient. Two more days, one more day, half a day. When he went back, there were one or two very dismal nights indeed. He went so far as to write home some vague intimation of his feelings about business and his prospects, quoting Minton. But Mrs. Kipps answered him, Did he want the pornicks to say he wasn't good enough to be a draper? This dreadful possibility was, of course, conclusive in the matter. No, he resolved they should not say he failed at that. He derived much help from a manly sermon delivered in an enormous voice by a large, fat, sun-red clergyman, just home from a colonial bishopric he had resigned on the plea of ill health, exhorting him that whatever his hand found to do, he was to do with all his might, and the revision of his catechism preparatory to his confirmation reminded him that it behoved him to do his duty in that state of life into which it had pleased God to call him. After a time the sorrows of Kipps grew less acute, and save for a miracle, the brief tragedy of his life was over. He subdued himself to his position, even as his church required of him, seeing, moreover, no way out of it. The earliest mitigation of his lot was that his soles and ankles became indurated to the perpetual standing. The next was an unexpected weekly whiff of freedom that came every Thursday. Mr. Shulford, after a brave stand for what he called inchful liberty and the idea of my system, a stand which he explained he made chiefly on patriotic grounds, was at last, under pressure of certain of his customers, compelled to fall in line with the rest of the local early closing association, and Mr. Kipps could emerge in daylight and go where he listed for long, long hours. Moreover, Minton, the pessimist, reached the end of his appointed time and left, to enlist in a cavalry regiment and go about this planet leading an insubordinate but interesting life that ended at last in an intimate, vivid and really, you know, by no means painful or tragic night grapple in the Terror Valley. In a little while Kipps cleaned windows no longer. He was serving customers, of the less important sort, and taking goods out on approval, and presently he was third apprentice and his moustache was visible, and there were three apprentices whom he might legally snub and cuff, but one was, most dishonestly, too big to cuff, in spite of his greener years. 5. There came still other distractions, the natural distractions of adolescence, to take his mind off the inevitable. His costume, for example, began to interest him more. He began to realise himself as a visible object, to find an interest in the costume room mirrors and the eyes of the girl apprentices. In this he was helped by counsel and example. Pierce, his immediate senior, was by way of being what was called a masher, and preached his cult. During slack times, grave discussions about collars, ties, the cut of trouser legs, and the proper shape of a boot toe were held in the Manchester department. In due course, Kipps went to a tailor, and his short jacket was replaced by a morning coat with tails. Stirred by this, he purchased at his own expense three stand-up collars to replace his former turned-down ones. They were nearly three inches high, higher than those Pierce wore, and they made his neck quite sore and left a red mark under his ears. So equipped, he found himself fit company, even for this fashionable apprentice who had now succeeded Minton in his seniority. Most potent help of all in the business of forgetting his cosmic disaster was this— that so soon as he was in tailcoats, the young ladies of the establishment began to discover that he was no longer a horrid little boy. Hitherto they had tossed heads at him and kept him in his place. Now they discover that he was a nice boy, which is next door at least to being a fella, and in some ways even preferable. It is painful to record that his fidelity to Anne failed at their first onset. I am fully sensible how entirely better this story would be, from a sentimental point of view, if he had remained true to that early love, only then it would have been a different story altogether, and at least Kipps was thus far true, 
that with none of these later loves was there any of that particular quality that linked Anne's flushed face and warmth and the inner things of life so inseparably together, though they were not without emotions of various sorts. It was one of the young ladies in the costume room who first showed by her manner that he was a visible object and capable of exciting interest. She talked to him, she encouraged him to talk to her, she lent him a book she possessed and darned a sock for him and said she would be his elder sister. She allowed him to escort her to church with a great air of having induced him to go. Then she investigated his eternal welfare, overcame a certain affectation of virile indifference to religion and exhorted a promise that he would undergo confirmation. This excited the other young lady in the costumes, her natural rival, and she set herself with great charm and subtlety to the capture of the ripening heart of Kipps. She took a more worldly line. She went for a walk with him to the pier on Sunday afternoon, and explained to him how a gentleman must always walk outside a lady on a pavement, and how all gentlemen wore, or at least carried, gloves, and generally the broad beginnings of the British social ideal. Afterwards the ladies exchanged words upon sabbatical grounds. In this way was the Togar Virilis bestowed on Kipps, and he became recognised as a suitable object for that platonic Eros whose blunted darts devastate even the very highest class establishments. In this way, too, did that pervading ambition of the British young man to be, if not a gentleman, at least mistakably like one, take root in his heart. He took to these new interests with a quite natural and personal zest. He became initiated into the mysteries of flirting, and, at a slightly later stage, and with some leading hints from Pierce, who was of a communicative disposition in these matters, of the milder forms of spooning. Very soon he was engaged. Before two years were out he had been engaged six times, and was beginning to be rather a desperate fellow, so far as he could make out. Desperate, but quite gentlemanly, be it understood, and without let or hindrance to the fact that he was in four brief lessons prepared by a distant-mannered and gloomy young curate, and confirmed a member of the established church. The engagements in drapery establishments do not necessarily involve a subsequent marriage. They are essentially more refined, less coarsely practical, and altogether less binding than the engagements of the vulgar rich. These young ladies do not like not to be engaged, it is so unnatural, and Mr Kipps was as easy to get engaged to as one could wish. There are, from the young lady's point of view, many conveniences in being engaged. You get an escort for church and walks and so forth. It is not quite the thing to walk abroad with a fellow, much more to spoon with him, when he is neither one's fiancé nor an adopted brother. It is considered either a little fast or else a savouring of the walking out habits of the servant girls. Now such is the sweetness of human charity, that the shop young lady in England has just the same horror of doing anything that savours of the servant girl as the lady journalist, let us say, has of anything savouring of the shop girl, or the really quite nice young lady has of anything savouring of any sort of girl who has gone down into the economic battlefield to earn herself a living. But the very deepest of these affairs was still among the shallow places of love. At best it was paddling, where it is decreed that men must sink or swim. Of the deep and dangerous places, and of the huge buoyant life of its wave, he tasted nothing. Affairs of clothes and vanities there were, jealousies about a thing said, flatteries and mutual boastings, climaxes in the answering grasp of hands, the temerarious use of Christian names, culminations in a walk, or a near confidence, or a little pressure more or less. Close sitting on a seat after twilight with some little fondling was indeed the boldest of lovers' adventures, the utmost limit of his enterprises in the service of that stark great lady who is the daughter of Uranus and the sea. The young ladies who reigned in his heart came and went like people in an omnibus. There was the vehicle, so to speak, upon the road, and they entered and left it without any cataclysm of emotion. For all that, this development of the sex interest was continuously very interesting to Kipps, and kept him going as much as anything through all these servile years. 6. For a tailpiece to this chapter, one may vignette one of those little affairs. It is a bright Sunday afternoon. The scene is a secluded little seat, halfway down the front of the Lees, and Kipps is four years older than when he parted from Anne. There is a quite perceptible down upon his upper lip, 
and his costume is just as tremendous a mash as lies within his means. His collar is so high that it scars his inaggressive jawbone, and his hat has a curly brim, his tie shows taste, his trousers are modestly brilliant, and his boots have light cloth uppers and a button at the side. He jabs at the gravel before him with a cheap cane, and glances sideways at Flo Bates, the young lady from the cash desk. She is wearing a brilliant blouse and a gaily trimmed hat. There is an air of fashion about her that might disappear under the analysis of a woman of the world, but which is quite sufficient to make Kipps very proud, to be distinguished as her particular fella, and to be allowed, at temperate intervals, to use her Christian name. The conversation is light and gay in the modern style, and Flo keeps on smiling, good temper being her special charm. "'You see, you don't mean what I mean,' he is saying. "'Well, what do you mean? Not what you mean. Well, tell me. Oh, that's another story.' Pause. They look meaningly at one another. "'You are one for being roundabout,' says the lady. "'Well, you're not so plain, you know.' "'Not plain? No.' You don't mean to say I'm roundabout? No, I mean to say, though, pause, well, you're not a bit plain, you're, his voice jumps up to a squeak, pretty, see? Oh, get out, her voice lifts also with pleasure. She strikes him with her glove, then glances suddenly at a ring upon her finger. Her smile disappears momentarily. Another pause. Eyes meet and the smile returns. I wish I knew, says Kipps. Knew? Where you got that ring? She lifts the hand with the ring until her eyes just show very prettily over it. You'd just like to know, she says slowly, and smiles still more brightly with a sense of successful effect. I dare say I could guess. I dare say you couldn't. Couldn't I? No. Guess it in three. Not the name. Ah. Oh. Ah, well, anyway, let me look at it. He looks at it, pause, giggles, slight struggle, and a slap on Kipp's coat sleeve. A passer-by appears down the path, and she hastily withdraws her hand. She glances at the face of the approaching man. They maintain a bashful silence until he has passed. End of chapter 2